right here. Um, welcome everyone to the Emerging India webinar. Um, we have a great group of professionals today to give just an insight and overview um, into what to expect when doing business in India and perhaps why you should consider doing so. Um, my name is Rianne Ripple. I'm with World Trade Center Utah. Many of you are probably already familiar with our organization, but for those of you who aren't, um, WTC Utah exists to help Utah companies expand globally. Um, our mission is to accelerate growth for Utah companies through our global network programs and services. And to achieve that here at our office, we do a number of things. Um, we provide consulting services to companies that include market expansion and funding, as well as global supply chain optimization. We host trade events, which um, include educational events, much like today's webinar, um, host foreign delegations to provide insight into their countries and respective markets, and take Utah companies on trade missions, business trips, and to trade shows around the world. Um, a lot of these services also cost money. Uh, so we also distribute the Small Business Administration State Trade Expansion Program Grant, or STEP grant for short, because that's a mouthful, um, here in Utah, which can be used for a lot of those programs and services. Um, that's a quick overview of us, and I'll drop our website in the chat if you'd like to know more and explore more about us. But for now, I'll kick it over to Troy Keller, who is um, a partner at Dorsey & Whitney Law Firm here in Utah, and also WTC Utah's International Trade and Commercial Policy Advisor, and he'll be leading our discussion today. So, Troy, all yours. Thanks, Fran, and thanks everyone for uh, for, for for joining. Um, and um, we'll before we before we jump in, I just wanted to also thank our panelists. Um, we, I mean, they, as you're going to see, they are uh, deeply experienced. A group with some great uh, experience in India and some stories to tell, and and we have a mixture of Utah companies, uh, people who are in U in India right now uh, who have experience on the well, all all this team has experience on the ground, and some who are, who are there full time, and uh, and I'm just thankful for them for spending for spending some time with us because they are all very busy people. Um, so you can see their their names and bios here. I think folks are probably familiar with. OC Tanner and Savage, some 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 great Utah companies, uh, and so Ty Brown, who is uh, the, the 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 executive vice president over international uh, expansion for OC Tanner, which has become a very international company uh, over the years. Amy Smedley, who is general counsel and EVP at Savage, which is uh, a uh, one of the largest infrastructure and logistics companies in 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 the U.S. headquartered here in uh, in. Uh, in Utah. David Paradiso uh, did his uh, MBA here in Utah and uh, a lot of a lot of family and ties here here to the area. He's lived in India for, for a number of years working with a venture capital firm there. And Sandeep Loda, a uh, good friend to uh, Utah and Utah businesses who is a, an accountant and uh, a, real, a real helpful um, a real helpful source of knowledge and, uh, uh, and, and practical uh, advice. So what we're going to do now though is I did that very fast because I I would like to hear from each of them and let them kind of tell their a little bit about their organizations and a little bit about their about their you know their their India India story so to speak and then we'll get into some substantive questions after that so um, let's start with uh, we'll just go right to left and start with Sandeep if that's okay Sandeep why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and, and how, you know, a little bit about, uh, about your, you know, India experience, which I think is probably the, the most of anyone here on the call. Hey, thanks, Troy. And thanks, uh, uh, Ryan from Utah team for giving this opportunity for me to, uh, you know, explain, uh, share my experience about, uh, you know, what is the process of, uh, you know, uh, rather the, the root of how, you know, foreign companies can uh, come into, uh, India. Uh, uh, so about me, uh, I am a chartered accountant, uh, founding and uh, managing partner of my firm, SVRG and OLLP. It is a assurance and advisory services firm with uh, 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 with uh, services all across India. We are also part of uh, an international organization by name EAI International. It's a group of uh, global accounting firm, and uh, we are one of their member firms. Uh, our firm has uh, four partners uh, and we have close to 40 staff 
and uh, uh, we have been working with uh, uh, companies uh, from across the world and have been you know uh, helping them with uh, uh, setting up indian operations uh, uh, helping them with uh, uh, you know anything that is needed for them to have the uh, swiftest uh, uh, you know uh, start of business in india and uh, we have been fortunate to work with uh, many companies from us uh, from uk from uh, europe and uh, it's been a great journey and uh, we are and, and and this is one of the best time you know for this event to happen because uh, uh, our prime minister mr narendra modi was in in us uh, last week as you all know and uh, the kind of discussions the kind of dialogues that happened between the us government and the indian government shows the confidence of uh, of, of both the governments uh, you know and uh, it it augurs really well for uh, for uh, for uh, for growth of uh, business uh, you know either way you know from india to us and us to india and, you know in particularly uh, utah based company uh, this is one of the Uh, you know of its vast uh, you know population uh, population is one thing but the pop- but, but it is also very uh, uh, the population is very skilled and uh, can be uh, you know uh, one of the major source of growing scaling their operations uh, i think so this is about uh, me uh, anything uh, i think more we can discuss as the program uh, progresses Sandeep, yeah, thanks so much. One last question for you uh, before we move on. What what's the weather like where you're sitting right now in India? Uh, it is the onset onset of monsoon in India. So it is a delayed monsoon. Uh, generally, monsoon starts in the first week of June, but uh, you know weather has changed uh, over the years. So this time uh, we are facing monsoon. Uh, you know, end of June. So hoping you know the temperature, which was around 36, 37 degree, uh, will come down to below 30. in next few days. Nice. Well, we're just coming out of the first monsoon season Utah's ever had. We've had kind of a really wet wet year so far. So it's great. Okay. Oh. Um David, over to you. Sure. Thank you, Troy. Hi everyone. David Paradiso here. A little bit of a world citizen, but originally from Argentina. Uh as Troy mentioned, I did my MBA at BYU in Provo. And uh, then I joined a uh, Danish company called My Invest uh which is an asset management with uh, several different strategies one of them being impact investing uh with uh, private equity funds and that's the the team where I am at uh we have been with I've been with them since 2015 uh and we focus on financial inclusion uh companies in emerging markets I moved to India back in 2018 so it's been almost 5 years now I I live in Mumbai with my family and it is raining super heavily here so we're a little worried we're going to drown but uh yes uh, my expertise again is investments in emerging markets uh, last 5 years here in India so happy to contribute with uh, my you know limited knowledge and uh, and my experience to benefit you all Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Let's go. Oh good. Let's go to Ty next. Oh. Cool. Uh my name's Ty Brown. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh as Troy pointed out, I'm with the OC Tanner company. Uh many of you may know us. Our only direct to consumer wing is our jewelry store. So a lot of people in Utah think we're a jewelry company and and we are, but that's about 2% of our revenue. most of our uh, business is business to business and it's uh, in the corporate uh, co- corporate culture and employee appreciation industry we're a 96 year old family run family owned company and uh, for the last 20 years or so we've been expanding globally and as part of that we, in 2014 my wife and I moved to India to open OC Tanner India Uh we spent 3 years there and and uh we're fortunate enough to be part of a fantastic team of people that are now the basis of about 200 people that are part of OC Tanner in India. 
so it's uh, it's been a fun journey. It's uh, it started with well, I guess it started with one me, and uh, has kind of grown from there. So we have some experience starting from the ground up, and and uh, happy to be part of the discussion today. Hope it'll be helpful. Thanks, Ty. Okay, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Troy said, I'm with Savage, which is a supply chain uh, infrastructure company, primarily operating in North America with a, a, a few outliers. My any experience comes from my uh, role at Huntsman Corporation, where I spent 16 years prior to coming to Savage. And in that role, I oversaw litigation for the company. So I've been a lawyer in the corporate world for 19, 18 plus years now. And at Huntsman, I had responsibility for litigation, including litigation in India, which was interesting and at times frustrating and at times really fun. And also compliance over a period of time. And Huntsman is a U.S. public company. And so we had U.S public company obligations when it came to compliance. And, and as you're, many of you are probably familiar with um, being over seen by the SEC and the DOJ paying particularly att close attention back in uh, the last decade around FCPA issues. And so that was a really uh, big focus of some of our compliance efforts in India, in addition to other areas, of course. But I had the opportunity of of visiting India uh, on occasion. I worked with Troy while he was at Huntsman. And so Troy is uh, Tr Troy is really the expert here from, uh, from my perspective on our India experiences. But I really enjoyed my time working with my India colleagues, working with uh, other businesses there and really enjoyed my visits and had some really fun experiences. <laughs> we'll say fun. Uh, and interesting experiences to share that might be helpful uh, or perspectives that might be helpful, but certainly not as uh, deep in India as the other panelists, but hopefully I can add something that might benefit some of you. Well, the compliance piece is, is so critical everywhere and India is no exception. And, and Amy, that's why we thought of her immediately because of, uh, she, there's no one who knows compliance uh in i don't know in the state anywhere uh, better than better than amy and uh i was good at doing deals and, and creating issues and then she would come clean yeah. up. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> she's done by it yep that's true <laughs> okay um so let's so let, we're going to start really high level and um and then we'll get into a, a little more detail we'll keep the whole presentation fairly high level um for the participants uh feel free if you have questions um i would you know ask that you go ahead and submit them through the chat feature and we will address those you know as as we see them or at the end we'll kind of you know play it by ear a little bit but don't hesitate to to send questions in that way otherwise we'll we'll just talk about whatever seems interesting to us but but if there's something you want to hear about <laughs> definitely send us a, a question okay so um as uh, Sandeep mentioned Prime Minister Modi uh, came uh, to the U.S. last week was warmly received um I thought it was use, useful to note that he came uh, a few years ago and uh, in this, this big event in Texas that kind of um, uh, celebrated the Indian uh, diaspora here in, in, in the U.S. And President Trump attended that and, and they had a warm um, meeting then as well. So I wanted to talk for a second about the the fact that India is not part of NATO. It's, you know, it's sometimes you know, it tries to be in some ways a friend, uh, a friend to everyone. And so it has business ties with with Russia and Iran or has has historically. Um, and so there's, you know, so geopolitically there, you know, there there is it, it ha doesn't fit nicely in any particular bucket. And um, so I wanted to ask this group if and, and sometimes we'll see headlines, sometimes really positive, sometimes maybe not so positive about, you know, about uh, geopolitics and where different countries fit in. In your experience doing business uh, generally, but particularly in India, do you see those types of issues popping up very often in, in again, in the context of doing business and, and, um, and, and do you think that's important to factor in? And I'll just open that up to anyone on the panel. Well, I can, 
I can speak to it, Troy, but I'm afraid our experience is a reasonably smaller. Our total revenue as a company is just hovering around a billion dollars. So we're not a publicly held company and you may know more about this than I do, but I saw no impact to this on the ground. Um, India, it seems to maintain a, a strategic non-alignment. So they're, you know, they, they buy arms from, uh, uh, from Russia as part of the old, the old, you know, it's been that way since the Cold War, I imagine. But uh, yeah. But for us on the ground, we had no issues as a as a U.S. company starting up our as, as a sales opportunity. Most of our clients are the very large companies that are tend to be multinational firms, and we saw um, nothing but uh, but well a, a welcome business environment now. It was a difficult business. I mean, they in India they say the British uh, the British invented bureaucracy, but the Indians perfected it. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't at times easy. But I saw no issue with uh, with a geopolitical lean one way or the other. Uh, I'll just pitch in here. So uh, you know, what Troy is perfectly you know correct. You know, India is maintaining. Uh, uh, you know, relations, uh, balanced relation with US, uh, with Europe, with Russia, but, you know, it's the other way around as well. US also wants India, Russia also wants India, and the Europe also wants India because of, you know, the China factor, you know, uh, other related geopolitical factor. But these are more on the geopolitical side. Uh, uh, if you that aside, I think India is one of the, you know, uh, country wherein uh, it, it has been very in business. Yes, in a uh, uh, compliance heavy as uh, ME has, uh, you know, said initially. But uh, at the same time, because of the kind of population India has, the kind of, uh, you know, bureaucracy that India has, uh, it cannot be a smooth, you know, uh, not like zero compliance kind of, you know, uh, setup in India. You are compliances, but uh, they are, you know, easy to manage. I mean, it has never been a case where a company has set up an operations in India, but the operations could not be started uh, or commenced because of any political or any other kind of reason. Uh, it And over the years, the ease of doing business index in India has really improved a lot. You know, there have been so many structural tax reforms in India in the form of uh, goods and services tax, wherein... Uh, uh, the entire nation has one single uh, VAT rate. Uh, uh, you go, you you can set up business, your business in any part of India. Uh, the tax rate will remain same, and so is the case of uh, corporate tax. And uh, corporate tax is also the same, uh, you know, all through the India. So, uh, so political geopolitical uh, issues aside, uh, I don't see any issue uh, faced by any foreign company uh, who has done business in India. That's uh, yeah. my experience, uh, you know of living in India since so many years. I mean, since my birth, obviously, and uh, being into practice since last 14 years. If I might add uh, just my two cents from an investment perspective, uh, India has been very welcoming of uh, foreign uh, money. We have LPs uh, from the US and from Europe, and there has been uh, no restrictions. Obviously, there are some caps for international and domestic uh, equity, especially in financial services. But that aside, bringing money into the country and taking money out of the country for yes. investments that have to be approved by the Central Bank of India has been pretty straightforward. There is paperwork, of course, as everything in India, but uh, yeah. the only caveat I would say here, uh, China is a little bit on a red list right now, especially for financial services, but uh, the rest of the world is uh, much welcomed in my experience. From a manufacturer's perspective, I always felt like the, the politics weren't as important, you know, the, the global politics, because of the, 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 I guess the importance of the regional presence was much more outweighed any kind of global political issue. However, there were local politics and local issues from time to time with some of the facilities that were were problematic and could be influenced by the global piece right, depending on what was happening in the world at the time. But overall, I think from a manufacturer's perspective, it was 
it was not difficult from a geopolitical standpoint. There were some compliance issues from time to time on, on trade compliance, but those were over, we were able to overcome those fairly easily uh, in retrospect. I think those are great points. Uh, and I think two important takeaways we just heard is that, you know, it's, this isn't just like a, uh, this isn't just a moment in time. India has been um, a, a good place, a great place to do business in for a long, long period of time. And, uh, and it's been, it's, it's welcomed foreign investment, of course, and has, uh, has treated uh, uh, visitors, visitors well. The other um, piece that I think is more of a moment in time that was, that was mentioned is, you know, is, is, just the, 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 the dynamic involving China increases India's importance on the manufacturing side as a, as a market, now the largest market in the world, the largest you know, population and the largest democracy in the world. So um, so good. I think this is, this is a really good, really good way to start out to, to point, point out some of the, um, yeah. some of the important things about, uh, about global relationships and where India fits in. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. So this is, uh, a step down in in uh, in specificity, but still high level. So we're going to talk about some of the opportunities presented by India. So I, I'm sure you know a lot of these will be fairly obvious, but some maybe not not things you, people might have thought about before. So let's we're going to kind of go down the list here. And um, for uh, the first one, we talk about the consumer market being the most populous nation, largest market in the world. Uh, um, world's largest democracy, um, and welcome anyone's thoughts on that one. But maybe I'll, I'll, David. I know your, um, I know your business invests a lot in the financial services side, which is, you know, which is a segment. But um, obviously, your probably your your investments then turn and cater to 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 consumers. And how do you guys think about India as a marketplace? Well, I always say that. Uh... The British used to call India the Indian subcontinent, <laughs> not a country. And it, it seems that way, and we can talk about more of that later, but certainly uh, the demand here for almost any service is, is massive. Uh, and there are diff very different markets between South, North, East and West, and sometimes between states. But uh, overall, under the same country, the same uh, regulation, so there is a massive market. Uh, most of the consumers are still with their capacity to purchase is not as big as you know first world countries, but certainly it's growing. The middle class in India has been growing significantly over the last uh, few decades. So, as as you rightly say, uh, there is almost infinite demand, as we say, uh, in our business for any type of uh, business or industry or consumer markets that you can think of. So that will be my perspective. Kai, when you when you went there with OC Tanner, was that because of the market or was it because of the manufacturing opportunity? What was the what was the main strategic reason for for, for putting for opening an office there in India? No, the main drive was was the local market. Now we had, there were two factors to that. One is uh, most of our clients, like I said before, the large multinational clients and the, <clears throat> the multinational firms that are our clients were just, they were moving into India in a big way. So our, our first priority, or our first objective was to better support our multinational clients that were either based in Europe or the United States the second objective was to uh, to tap into the local market. There are a lot of very large firms in India that we that uh, for employee engagement and customer appreciation that the cultural fit for us was a was a pretty good fit. Um, companies in India were are worried about uh, employee engagement and hiring and retention and and uh, the culture of their business. So. We made the move, be, uh, a two-pronged approach, one to support our existing clients and another to expand in the market. Uh, Troy, I would say that you know our, our market is not necessarily a consumer market. Uh, the consumer market in India is is a bit different. You know, it's uh, the wealth in India tends to be 
uh, you know, somewhat concentrated uh, in the larger city centers. And, and, and as David pointed out rightly, the, the middle class has been expanding uh, in huge numbers, but it's still, uh, it's not 1.2 billion that are the, the middle class. So some of the consumer products are, are you know, really targeted and potentially a 1.2 billion people like the phone, the mobile phone industry is is huge in India. But on the other hand, a lot of the consumer, what we would think of in the US as a consumer product may have a, a more limited market in India, but even a limited market in India still means a hundred million people. <laughs> so, so it's just a big, it's a big consumer market. For us, it was the business to business play. It was the opportunity. There's a lot of large firms in India and a good cultural fit for us. That's great, Ty. Thanks. Troy, I would say, I would add just on your third bullet, because, mm -hmm. you know, Huntsman was manufacturing products, you know, business to business. We were, we didn't have, well, we had a little bit of a consumer market in, uh, in India through a partner, but um, the third bullet, the, the talent piece, I was, I found the, colleagues that I worked with in India to be excellent. The lawyers we worked with were excellent. The business leaders we worked with were excellent. Accountants, you know, every kind of role that you need to be filled for a company in India can be filled by, uh, you know, somebody in India and, it, and, and they are terrific and they, and they would cover not just India issues, but they'd cover regional issues and even global issues, depending on the need of the department. And so I, I think I'm a big advocate for the India talent because there are such great people there who are very skilled in, you know, almost anything that a company might need uh, to do business in India. Amy, that's a great point. I mean, I was thinking through my head the other day, how many like leaders, CEOs we have in, in Utah that, you know, that are, that are, that are, that are from India, Indian nationality. Um, Sandy, it, you know, I don't know, not to put you on the spot, but do you know, I mean, it seems like there are a lot of highly educated people that come out of India. Um, is that just because of the yeah. huge population or is there a, you know, a systemic, you know, kind of focus on that, on education? Oh, uh, India, uh, India has some of the best uh, education institutions. Uh, and uh, many Indians, uh, you know, uh, I think they, they, they uh, apart from India, they, they, you know, go to, you know, US or UK or Germany, you know, to take higher education. And uh, uh, I think, but the, the root, the base, uh, you know, uh, the primary education in India is very strong. And that has really helped the, in, the Indian, uh, Indian, uh, uh, the young generation to you know have a a, a, a better base uh, at the uh, you know while while studying in the school and once they grow it really helps them to you know do well at university level and from there you know i mean you see a lot of uh, ceos in us uh, you know across the world are from india so that is one of the reason i see you know india now uh, it's not just the population it's also the primary education that has uh, been very good in india Thanks, Maybe, man. Troy, if I can add one very important aspect that I found uh, in India that you don't find in some other countries in Asia is people speaking English, good English. It's extremely yeah. high, the percentage, compared to many other countries. Trust me, that makes a huge difference, huge mm -hmm. difference, because you can communicate, you can you know, understand each other, plan well, and there are no languages barriers as you will find in some other big markets in the region yeah yes, I, I completely agree thanks Sandeep. yeah I, that's a great point we both accept because you know I, you go to other parts of asia including china and and as soon Hard. as you get past you know the first layer just yeah. people do not speak 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 english um you know not that they need to but but it is convenient it's very convenient for 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 u.s businesses to to come to India and everybody speaks English. Okay, um, so let's go to the next slide. There's another interesting uh, 
uh, and I'm still learning more about this, but, but a fascinating uh, kind of trend in India that has been getting some attention lately, although I think it's been going on for, for nearly a decade now. And just to set it up for a little bit of perspective, um, folks here in Utah, you may or may not have even heard of, but, uh, but earlier this year, our legislature uh, um, uh, authorized the state to start issuing digital driver's licenses. I don't have one yet. Uh, I think I'm on the list. I'm excited to, to get one one of these days and I'll just have my driver's license on my phone. Seems like a really big deal. Well, apparently this is really old news in India and they have a lot more than just that. So um, David, I am gonna turn to you again because I know that you, uh, your, your investment strategy is you know, kind of involves some of this and you've been part of this, your, your firm has. Do you wanna explain a little bit what, what DPI uh, is and even maybe describe the, the the photo that 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 you so kindly took and and, and let us you know put here in the presentation. Yes, just maybe just to give you as a perspective uh, with this picture, this is in a very remote rural area of India. Uh, this is a lady who barely uh, spoke English, who has a very very uh, small livelihood. And what she's doing with her fingerprint, she's authorizing a bank transfer, a wire transfer from her account to the fintech company that had lended her some money. Uh, that is the level of how the digital infrastructure has been developed in India uh, in several ways, both in the financial world, in the healthcare, and uh, many, many others. Um, so right now, just in practical ways, we buy everything from our phone in our home. Obviously, yeah. this was before COVID was good. COVID made it, basically everything is available through your phone. You can have a doctor appointment, <laughs> set it up in your phone, and he's going to call you, and then you know, he's gonna have a consultation and update your records and you can, and he's gonna shoot a, an order to the pharmacy that is gonna send the medicines to your home. So I don't carry a wallet anymore in India. I carry my phone, I pay with QR codes and several other uh, uh, digital um, ways. And basically India has from the government and in conjunction with the uh, private companies, created this massive digital public infrastructure in which in different databases and uh, uh, government own um, digital programs, you can have your information stored and even your biometrics. So you can do things like this uh, good lady is doing. She can authorize a wire transfer with her thumbprint. Uh, we have seen this develop over the years extremely, extremely rapidly. There are tons of investments going to this area. And certainly, either if you're a technology investor or a fintech investor, certainly this is a great place to be. But also any other business can benefit from learning or being part of this uh, ecosystem of uh, dig digital public infrastructure. It's certainly amazing. And I have my thumbprint and my iris registered with the Indian government. You need that in order to open a bank account. And I could use that to do a lot of things that it's unheard of in other parts of the world. So that, in a nutshell, that's what's happening today. And obviously, there are many very innovative business models uh, coming up in, in small private companies that are going to transform this to the next step. Um, so. David Sandeep, is that available for, like, if let's say you are a U.S. or Utah fintech, we have a lot of fintech companies in Utah. Can you take that business model and plug into this? Or do you need to be, you know, is, is that challenging for, you know, for a, for a, for, you know, for a, a non-Indian company? So you mean to say from Indian company, the same thing can be uh, translated in, 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 in Utah company or uh, I'm not clear with the question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, vice vice versa. Versa. yeah. yeah. If you're a Utah company and you come in and you have a great, you know, application, uh, financial services or whatever, can you make use of the, 
of the dig of the digit of the digital public infrastructure in India uh, to, to for your business. Yeah, I mean, uh, you you can do it because uh, it's uh, I mean there so Google is there. Google has a you know similar kind of uh, setup in India where you just need to you know scan the QR code and pay if you have account with Google. WhatsApp, uh, you know, it has a similar feature. Amazon, it has a similar feature. So all these companies, uh, they are able to, you know, uh, set the same, same similar kind of platform for making the payment. So if you go, if I go back to the previous slide on the consumer uh, uh, products, uh, one of the reason for the growth in the consumer durable rated, uh, you know, product is on account of the Digital India uh, uh, campaign by the government. Uh, you uh, you have uh, all the app. You just need to you know buy what you want to buy and just make the payment online. You don't have to. You need to have credit card or anything. Just uh, it, because uh, the the uh, there is something called as UPI uh, uh, Unified uh, Protocol Interface uh, and. Uh, once you have that on your phone, you can just uh, transfer money without any hassle. So as David has rightly said, it is very easy and convenient to buy anything in India. You don't need a wallet, you don't need a credit card, just your phone is enough and you can move around across India, even a product as less as, uh, you know, uh, less than say one cent, you can buy through this UPI. You just don't need cash or coins to purchase uh, things in India. Uh, on top of it, Indian government is, uh, you know, also coming up with a digital currency to counter the cryptocurrency because uh, as such, Indian government hasn't yet uh, recognized uh, cryptocurrency, you know, as a as a legal uh, thing. So they are started, uh, uh, they have started recently with the concept of Indian digital currency. It is at its initial phase, but a lot of banks have started uh, the groundwork uh, on it and maybe you know after a couple of years uh, you may see a digital currency in india uh, i'll add one more point like you have a visa you have mastercard in india we have rupee rupee is another you know of, uh, you know uh, uh, you know companies and uh, which has uh, acceptability all across india and now the indian government is trying to make it uh, uh, make it uh, uh, acceptable in other countries, you know, like uh, uh, like uh, somewhere in uh, Saudi uh, Arabia and all these countries. So these kind of talks are going on. So a uh, lot of push on digital side. And uh, I think, you know, as David said, next five years, this could only get better from here. Well, that's a great point. I read something in, in, uh, in an article that mentioned that India, because the system has been so successful, um, is looking at exporting it to other locations, and maybe there's a business idea for, you know, for for Utah company. Uh, bring, bring. I'll just add one more one more point here. So when COVID happened, India was the first country who had this COVID app. COVID app was something that was able to, uh, you know, help uh, uh, you know track uh, COVID patients and a lot of other features were there. So the code, or uh, I don't know what is the right terminology. For you know that uh, the code behind uh, code for this COVID was given free by India to many countries because that was something you know which which required a lot of human efforts to build. But Indian government uh, was kind enough to you know share the code uh, with a uh, lot of countries. Uh, so even during COVID, COVID with such short you know time in hand, the government uh, the the Indian you know uh, infra the technology uh, team was able to you know develop such kind of app. Thank you. That's a great. That's a great. That's a great. Great. Great example. Okay, let's um let's keep going. We're going to talk about uh, now some, you know. So how do you? What are strategies for going into India? Um, and what we've listed out here are some basic approaches, not even India specific. This is these approaches are ones that when a company wants to go. Take their business model or or um, take advantage of manufacturing supply chain opportunities for what whatever reason they want to go establish a presence in a foreign market what are their options for doing that and these tend to be the structures it's not maybe i'm sure there are other there are other approaches but these tend to be the primary structures that that people will use and so we're going to talk about them a little bit as they as they might work in in india 
And um, so let's start with the one on the right, the ground up approach, which is, you know, what you what you probably assume is the, you know, without really thinking about it, you assume that's the, the obvious and, and basic way, which is you go into a country and and you start hiring some employees and you lease an office space and you, you know, you form a subsidiary and, and, and that is, that is a, that is a great way. And, but let's talk about it for a second. Ty, do you mind sharing? I know you did a little bit already, but do you mind sharing a little more of your experience when you um, got to India and, and how long it took maybe to get from day one to where you thought your operations were, were operating and anything else from that, you know, from that experience that might help people think about whether this is this is the best approach for them to uh, to use when when entering India. Yeah, sure, I will. I uh, we looked actually for opportunities to acquire, uh, and and uh, we were open to a partnership. We're just as a tech company. We, uh, by way of explanation, we started as a manufacturing company. 95 years ago doing uh, jewelry manufacturing, but in the last 20 or 30 years, our industry has moved more and more to tech. So now we're, uh, we have been successful in making the transition. We're now both a tech and manufacturing company, but most of our emphasis is on the tech side. As a tech company, um, we're a tough one to partner with. So the, the, the JV or, wasn't really an option for us because our sales cycles are long and <clears throat> we couldn't find anyone in India that, uh, that really was a good fit for us. Uh, we've done, I entered Europe actually with an acquisition and not uh, ground up. So we have some experience with acquisition. Um, the difficulty for us in acquisition uh, it wasn't the acquisition for us. The, the real tough thing was the integration. So it, it has to be a, for us, a, an acquisition had to be, you know, had to be a really good fit, both culturally and, and technology wise. And there just wasn't one that we found in India. So it made the strategic decision somewhat obvious for us that we had to go about doing a, a ground up if we were going to cover that market. Uh, and again, the ground up, it, yeah, it wasn't, it did take some time um, from the time, let's see, I guess my wife and I showed up there in 2014 and, and we didn't have a clue what to do. So we hired an accounting firm like Sandeep and, um, and started figuring out how to hire people and rent an office and set up a company and uh, the most important thing, obviously, is hiring great people. And we felt, I still, a lot of our team in India are the same people we hired that first year. They are just excellent leaders that I, I put up on a global stage anywhere. And having excellent people, it probably took us, oh, I'd say nine to 12 months before we were really online, having people trained, uh, getting customer support going, getting supply chain purchasing done. But it took a it took a couple of years really before we were uh, the marketing kicked in and we people started to know we were there and we could start selling successfully and and so it's not a it's not an easy quick process it just ended up being the right one for us. That's great perspective. Um, thanks, Ty. Uh, Sandeep, you help companies a lot in that scenario where they're coming and they you know, they just need to get started. Um, any thoughts from your end in terms of decision-making, whether, um, you know, whether what we're calling here the ground up approach is, tends to be effective in, in India? Well, I will say uh, it depends on company uh, to company, you know, what, uh, what kind of product they have. For example, for a for a technology uh, information technology company, it is easy to uh, have this ground up approach wherein they start a legal and set up a legal entity and uh, slowly build uh, the management team and then grow the, uh, the Indian team and integrate the same with the, the parent, which is in US. Uh, but if it is uh, say an automobile company, they would first like to, you know, taste the Indian market. So for that, instead of immediately setting a company, they would first like to understand the uh, the 
the local suppliers uh, the, uh, the 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 parts that can, that they can subcontract so you know for them their first target will be to you know work with someone on a j- joint venture basis and and it, until they are 100% satisfied they won't set up a company and once they are because it's a huge capital intensive business uh, and once it is capital intensive business uh, you know uh, it is always good to start with a jv process and then convert that either into uh, uh, an own entity like a wholly owned subsidiary or kind of an acquisition wherein they can acquire the firm with whom they were initially working on a jv model so this is what i have seen uh, uh, you know company to company this will vary so as uh, you know tai has initially said for him it was easy to set up a company initially because for him the capital uh, requirement was not huge it was mostly to uh, make salary payment to the staff uh, for one or two year until the team was ready but if it is a manufacturing company the costs are really high because you need to have a whole factory set up you need to have infrastructure machines everything in place and if things doesn't work it's a huge cost so uh, i think uh, this is the mo- I, this is the uh, basis you know one can decide either of the approach that's really wise sandeep it sounds like it, it it probably depends a lot on the nature of your business whether yeah. that's a great point to start a manufacturing facility and again we had some experience with that that can take years and years to get that off the ground versus buying someone uh, who's already there um but they both have risks any any thoughts from your end Yeah. I I feel fairly strongly that if you're in manufacturing, I think it would be really difficult to just go completely um you know from the ground up. You reminded me yesterday as we were talking that we had tried that after we'd already established a presence in India for, you know, for some years, we we developed a a small what we call a systems house. in India from the ground up but it took a really long time to get the permits to get it built and that was after already owning other manufacturing facilities that we had acquired through uh just through Acnoris JVs uh and so it wasn't um it wasn't very simple and i think depending on the i agree with Sandy for manufacturing and i also think that depending on the business you're in you 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 can't just go in cold if savage for example were to go in and try to develop an infrastructure business in india i think that would be almost impossible because you have to have relationships with rail partners you have to have relationships with trucking partners um with others with with other you know some of our multinational customers are certainly there and and know us and if there was kind of an insular service that we could provide there it, it makes sense but otherwise it would have to be an an acquisition i think before we could truly enter that market from a service provider perspective um which is which is primarily what uh, what savage is doing is providing services i will say acquisitions of course bring um uh, a fair set of challenges and unknowns as much diligence as you can do Uh, you will be surprised by things that come up post post uh, acquisition uh one in particular um purchasing a um a chemical and dyes plant um we did an incredible amount i thought of environmental due diligence going into the acquisition mm-hmm. and um including third party um you know the, the equivalent of you know phase 1 and phase 2 investigations that you would do here in the US um there in India including sampling of water sampling of the soil and as soon as we closed the water changed color <laughs> water was no longer clear and clean it was brown and uh you know part of that was relying probably on diligence from people who were probably close to the uh the prior owner and or were influenced by the prior owner to provide us some information that probably wasn't accurate and then having to live with that contamination you know for the next uh many years and and try to overcome it which 
which U.S. companies and other multinational companies certainly can do. And it, it is, you could remediate all of these things for the most part, but you should be going in, if you're going to buy a business, you've got to go in with your eyes open and, and expect some surprises regardless of, of your, of your diligence going in. Um, but it, but I think the rewards still outweigh the negatives, um, from a, from a marketing, from a market perspective, from a, uh, you know, local presence, regional presence that, uh, that it provided, but it is a, it is a unique, uh, unique situation to take over for an owner. If the owner is a multinational, I should have a little bit of a caveat. If the, if the owner is a multinational and has had strong relationships or has had strong relationships with other multinational companies, it's a little, it's probably not, as, there's not going to be probably as many surprises. If you're buying from a true uh, local uh, owner who is, tied in with the local com economy, local community, you're going to have a more difficult time, I think, replacing that local owner um, and their connections without some assistance from the prior owner. And that's helpful to have the prior owner stay involved for a period of time, if you can work that out in your agreement, um, just to help facilitate relationships, introductions, make the transition as smooth as possible. And also so you don't end up with disagreements with the prior owner. I noted the, in the legal news a few days ago, Simplot, which is a company up in headquartered up in Idaho, they had a, they were able to successfully win an arbitration uh, decision or award from um, an arbitration panel in Singapore against their India joint, joint venture partner and have now been trying to enforce it haven't had much success in, a, in India yet, trying to get it enforced in the U.S. against the India um, subsidiary. And so if your JV goes bad, <laughs> your remedies might be limited within India if you're trying to get legal remedies. I, yeah, I, I think a piece of advice that, that a lot of people are, would probably guess was the case anyways, you, with legal structures, which are incredibly important, and with and with due diligence, which is even more important. Um, what's what sort of what sort of you know is more important than everything is having you know doing business with someone that you that you trust, and and that's even that's not a cure all because they can be very trustworthy and people can have disagreements and and and, and issues, but but that does seem to be the number one thing is uh, you know spending the time to create those relationships like like Ty described. Um, so, uh, uh, David, what, 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 you know, what, what thoughts do you have? I know a lot of, I know you are investing directly into, in most cases, Indian, Indian companies. Do you see them partnering with, uh, with companies from outside of India with us or, 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 or otherwise, or any thoughts you have on, on structures that, that work well yeah. for a company coming into India? Yes. In, uh, most of the investments I've seen in, in, in the financial space are usually India-centered. Uh, There's because of the massive demand and the, the size of the market. However, there are several uh, type of uh, partnerships with international companies for different products, and uh, I've seen that uh, there has been no major problems making those. Uh, legal structures that not my expertise, but I've been in boards that have been approving and over have an oversight over those uh, joint ventures or partnerships, and they have been quite straightforward. Uh, so no, I, I think that's a that's a good good way to go. But certainly, you need to know your partner both inside in India and also outside of India. You know uh, that partnership, that marriage, if you want to call it that way, is very critical. Uh, make sure you understand the culture, the market, that you communicate well, and then you have both uh, teams, legal teams or marketing teams in both uh, sides of, uh, of, the, of the game, just understanding each other and talking to each other, because there could be some local uh, legal problems or some international 
barriers that are not well understood and that could create issues. But yes, I've seen that happening and it's actually quite common in my space. So with, thanks so much, David. With the, we just have a couple minutes left. Let's go to the last slide. And we just kind of listed a few challenges, which, which again are probably things that, you know, that are, that are the case in, in, in most, most, most foreign jurisdictions that, that are new to, new to a company. Let's, um, let's use this also as kind of our, our, our wrap up here. If, let, if we could just go to each panelist and if they could take one minute and, um, and either talk about challenges or, or just whatever thought they'd like to leave the, leave the group with. And then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. So um, let's just, let's start with, with Amy and uh, go to Sandeep and then David and then end with Ty. Sure, from my perspective, um, one of the biggest challenges was adopting a US compliance program for India companies and trying, trying to make sure that we were in compliance with our US obligations at the same time as being able to operate and, and, and comply with uh, India obligations. And I say that because it's, um, it's once you expose um, the labor force to the US compliance system, you are going to have hotline reports, whistleblower reports regularly and repetitively because the labor force uses that as a negotiation tool sometimes, and they use it as a way to force out management. And sometimes they're reporting accurate and, and problems that actually exist that have to be investigated. And so um, helping the company understand that maybe the way you investigate, the way you attack problems in India is different than in the US and it's okay to be different and it's okay to adjust to the risks of the market there, um, understanding the risks that it's going to uh, place on the US headquartered company. And so that was, that for me, because of my experience in compliance, that was one of the things that I learned is that we don't have to do it, you don't have to do it exactly the US way. You can adapt your US compliance program to work in India and still accomplish uh, compliance in both locations um, and globally, of course, to, to the extent that your India companies are interacting with other global partners. So, and I just thought I'd answer the question that came in the chat about what was uh, something that amused me on my way to the hotel or office. I, uh, I think I first landed in Mumbai. The, uh, the chaos of it was awesome. I love the chaos of the roads, yeah. driving from the airport <laughs> to the hotel, the people on the roads, the the, you know, the little cars on the roads, the mopeds, the cows, the everything, it was just in the dogs, it was awesome. And that's still to this day, that's one of my favorite memories is that experience of, of, of seeing the chaos that was organized, but yet chaotic, so. Awesome, thanks Amy. Okay, Sandy. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, so I mean, good point regarding, you know, her, uh, Amy's uh, visit to India. Uh, but uh, uh, so, you know, uh, I have seen over the years, uh, you know, the challenges has really reduced because uh, the Indian government is doing a lot uh, to improve the ease of doing business in India. But uh, still, I will say there are a couple of challenges. One is the, you know, the compliance. India is a compliance heavy country and especially for manufacturing companies, there are certain labor laws which are still ambiguous and, uh, you know, times the authorities, you know, tend to, you know, uh, tend to be a bit uh, rigid on, on on the on the companies uh, you know uh, with regard to what they are following and what is written in the law because of the ambiguity it has though indian government is coming up with a new labor law uh, in labor code which uh, is uh, expected to you know be uh, you know uh, put into place in next one or two two, two years and another challenge which I have seen is the uh, transfer pricing regulation, wherein there is always a debate, uh, the uh, you know uh, you know argument between the Indian tax authorities and the companies regarding the right transfer pricing markup that needs to be put for the uh, for the companies for the transactions doing with the uh, with their associated enterprises. So these are what I feel you know are the current challenges. Thanks, Andy. Sure. Uh, 
I will take the, the first one, especially is India truly a single market? And in a few aspects, yes, it's the biggest democracy. There is one government, there is uh, one regulation, there is one currency, but everything else, uh, it's a no. There are many different markets, there are many different cultures, many different languages, types of food, different religion, you know, sometimes state to state, things are completely different from a cultural standpoint, language, food, gods, and you name it. Uh, sometimes people from the South don't like people from the North and they don't <laughs> want management to come <laughs> from that side of the country. Yes, 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 yes. I'm Team Dosa, by the way. That's a, that's a Southern. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you think that you're going to tackle a whole India culture with just one trip, you'll have to visit many, many cities. <laughs> uh, you need to understand there are completely different. Uh, sometimes uh, local authorities have to approve things for you, and it's going to be different in Mumbai than Kolkata and Delhi. Um, of course, you have you know national taxes and regulation, which helps. Single currency helps a lot. Single digital infrastructure, it's amazing. But cultural wise, each country is different. Each each state is different. So don't make that mistake of thinking that you know one city, you know it all, because then then it's going to be tough. And answering the question, what impressed me? coming from a small town in Argentina, the amount of people, it was just, uh, you know, mind blowing to me. And, uh, you know, different colors, such a colorful country, different smells, different flavors. Uh, people is extremely friendly uh, with foreigners. Uh, at least that has been, has been my experience and my colleagues. So certainly it's a nice place uh, to live, a little chaotic. I agree with Amy but an amazing experience for, for me and my family. Thanks, David. Ty? Uh, just a couple brief thoughts. <clears throat> I'll echo what the others have said previously, all very good advice. Um, I'm gonna answer Shashin's question as a way to lead into my comment, but the first thing, my first trip to India, I, uh, I got off the plane and my most vivid memory is seeing an elephant walking down the middle of the road and uh, and followed shortly by seeing traffic coming to a stop for a cow that was in the road. And those two things just were mind blowing to me, but uh, I quickly learned not to judge a book by its cover. There's a lot of, um, uh, when one first arrives in, to echo what David said, when one comes to India, a lot of the visitors describe it as an assault on the senses because it's so visually colorful and chaotic and smells and sights. And, and some people can mistake it for a, a, a third world country or a, a very poor, but you know, it's often described as public squalor and private splendor because uh, when you actually go to a shopping mall, you could be anywhere in the United States or Europe and when you walk into businesses, it's the same. So don't let initial impressions throw you off on the market because there's a lot of <clears throat> highly educated, highly trained, uh, well-funded uh, companies and wealth uh, and wealthy individuals. And so don't uh, don't get thrown off by appearances there or initial impressions. It's a fantastic country with with wonderful people that. Uh, I will also echo that the bureaucracy, it's not easy. The culture is very different. They, they're speaking English, but at times you, uh, it, you'll be thrown off, but it's worth it because the people are great and the, the market potential is amazing. So uh, don't give up, it's worth doing. I just wanna thank all the participants. Um, I wanna thank our, our panelists for for their time and for and what a what a fun discussion and and I think you know I, I learned a ton I think everybody did the the market potential is is significant in India 
And in Utah, uh, we're lucky to have uh, people with experience that you've just seen on this panel and an incredible organization in the World Trade Center. Uh, one of the questions was, how do I find a, you know, uh, the a supplier, distributor, you know, a contact over there? Well, reach out to the folks at World Trade Center. If they don't know one off the off the top of their head, they know they 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 are the network of the Utah network and can put you in touch with someone who 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 will like like Sandeep or or David or Ty or Amy. And so please um please don't hesitate. Thanks to World Trade Center Utah uh, for all the great work they do, and thanks everyone. Uh, we'll 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 see you next time around.